This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. And welcome to the Condo Insider, our program about everything having to do with condominium living, condominium owning. Um, even last week we had how it was to buy a condominium. And this week I am pleased to um, have as my guest somebody who I've known for a number of years and have actually spoke with her at events. Um, over the years as a panel speaker and things like that. And that is Francine Wye, of the, who's the Executive Director of the Disability and Communication Access Board of the Department of Health. And welcome, Francine. Thank I'm you. so excited Thank to have you, you here Thank today. You. Um, as I mentioned before, you and I have spoken together at a number of events over the years. And um, I will admit that I have actually learned some things from you oh, over the you. years. So. <laughs> um, so first to start out our program today, which again is about condo living, but we'll get to that in just a little bit. But first I wanted to ask you, because I was curious myself, what is the Disability and Communication Access Board? Okay, well the Disability and Communication Access Board, we shortened it to call it DCAB, the, the initials DCAB. So okay. it's, it's just long for me to say that over <laughs> and again. So DCAB is a state agency. Uh, we are administratively attached to the Department of Health, and our job is to promote equal access for persons with disabilities in Hawaii, in society. So we have a number of programs that we offer. We are, we're not a direct service agency in the sense that we don't provide therapy or mm -hmm. counseling or rehab or education services. We don't actually have um, case workers, but what we do is we provide information and technical assistance and to some extent regulatory um, services on uh, that impact equal access for a person with a disability to benefit and to live independently in society. So you're, you're not actually going out and doing these things, but you're providing the information for the people who, who need the, the we, assistance. We, right, we, we don't actually go out uh, most of the time, yeah. but we do provide a number of services that are definitely interactive in, in the community. So as an example, we administer the parking program for people with disabilities okay. who get a placard. So we write the rules, we contract with the counties where you go and get your placard. We maintain the database. We get the, uh, the statistics. We order the placards. We order the decals. You know, we, we help with enforcement. We work on renewals. So we, we are what you would call technical assistance yeah. and voluntary compliance because there's so many laws that give people with disabilities rights. But we are really there to help both the consumer with a disability as well as the business or the employer or the government agency comply with the law. You know, our goal is to keep you away from court. Yes. Well, it's interesting you said there's so many laws. Um, just under my studies of the Americans with Disabilities Act, I have three notebooks on that. And they're fairly thick notebooks, and that's just the law. That's just one law. Yeah. <laughs> so, there's and of course, you have... there's fair housing law. There are laws that govern um, the air carriers, yep. access act airplanes. There's laws impacting kids in school. There are laws affecting telecommunications and the internet. Or so that there's there's a lot. But by far the most, um, the broadest, and the one people know the most about is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Mm -hmm. And then subsequent to that would be the fair housing. Would act. be the fair housing laws. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, you comment about uh, it's not just parking and things like that. Um, many years ago, even before the Americans with Disabilities came out, um, we had a call from a student wanting to attend one of our classes, and she was um, hearing impaired. So she was using the teletype at that time. And so we would talk to the operator, and the operator would type, and then type the response back. And I'm thinking to myself now that technology has come so far that now you have email, now you have texting, and a lot of what we were used to seeing, like even at the airport, you used to have telephones, 
that had the pull-out keyboard on them. Well, you still have those. Yeah. It's just that they're rarely used because technology, basically technology has advanced faster than government rules can. Well, this is true. Because yeah, <laughs> government rules are really, really slow. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, in my teachings of disability laws and stuff for, for the realtors, I've pointed out that it's been recognized that there are well over 900 recognized disabilities. But not all those disabilities require any special treatment, so to speak. Um, well, you're right that, that not all disabilities have a functional limitation. Yeah. I think um, the number 900, I mean, you can play around with how you categorize, but you know, there are as many medical conditions as you can diagnose going to medical school. Yeah. So each one of those is a separate impairment, mm -hmm. whether or not there's a functional limitation um, or not just depends upon the level of severity and, um, you know, mitigating factors. People have all sorts of conditions that are well controlled by medication. Yeah. So. Well, it's like uh, one instructor told me many, many, many years ago, um, not all disabilities are visible. That's so true. somebody could be disabled, may even need accommodation of some sort, but it's not visible. And that, I think that's what happens when you're dealing with the handicapped parking space, is somebody sees somebody get out of the car and walk away, and they go, well, you can't possibly be handicapped. Well, that's not necessarily so. Right. So, well, first, thank you for explaining what it is you actually do. <laughs> Yeah, beside parking, we do interpreter testing, credentialing. Oh, okay. We review uh, blueprints for uh, projects to ensure that they're designed appropriately. Uh, we help individuals uh, and their employers if they need to understand what a possible reasonable accommodation on the job is. Okay. But if you think you've personally been discriminated against, we don't investigate your complaint. You're, you're helping people stay away from that. Yes. But then they'd have to go to either Fair Housing or the Hawaii Civil right. Rights Commission right. if they feel that they've had right. something done wrong to yeah. them. And if somebody gets to that point and says, you know, I absolutely feel I've been wrong, then we'll tell them what the process is yeah. to file a complaint. Well, you had also pointed out that you help businesses. And I hope I'm not the only one who sends you crazy stuff. <laughs> although I'm beginning to think I am. But I one time had sent you a picture of a parking space that said handicap parking only, and right underneath it was another sign that says electric car parking only. Mm -hmm. And that raised an issue with me because it, uh, to me it was, it's either one or the other, yep. it's not both. It is. And, You're correct, yes. And, but you had mentioned in that one, and we won't say the name for the sake of propriety, <laughs> Um, that you had actually, guys, had reviewed their plan before they I opened? think in that particular instance, we had seen the, the space, although I, I can't remember where it was. Mm -hmm. But we would, I mean, to answer the very specific question, EV parking stalls have to be accessible so that someone yeah. who has a disability and has a car that needs to use that stall can use it, but those are separate than the accessible parking mm -hmm. stalls. And there's some discussion, you know, of that an EV, an EV location is really not a parking space. It's a charging station yeah. where you leave your car while it's being charged, as opposed to it being a parking space. Yeah, that's a good argument, though, yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now that we know what your department does, um, let's talk about where some issues would come up in, say, condominium living. And the first one would be um, which realtors and particular property managers have to deal with on a regular basis, and that's reasonable modifications. Yeah, reasonable modification is um, a structural issue. And by that, I mean that we're talking about the physical design of a space. So. If a condominium isn't designed to be accessible, then we talk about what kind of reasonable modification do you make. After the Fair Housing Act was enacted in 1988, all condos that were built and apartments, mm -hmm. multifamily yeah. dwelling units, were supposed to, and I mentioned supposed to because <laughs> not everything is done the way it's yeah. supposed to, 
But in theory, everything that was constructed after the Fair Housing Act w went into law is already supposed to be accessible. Mm -hmm. That's a common area, and then there are supposed to be certain features for every unit that is on a floor that's accessed by yeah. an elevator. Um, but usually the problem is not a new condo. The problem is an older yeah. condo. And the law does not have any requirement that they, the condos go back and retro, automatically mm -hmm. retrofit. So what the condo, what the fair housing law says is that a condo association has to consider a request by an individual yeah. with a disability who says, I need a ramp at the front door, I would like to um, maybe put uh, some uh, modification in to the uh, area where the pool is. Typically, the issue is ramps. Yes. Now, that's the, the most common. Um, or, or even a person says, you know, I own my unit, and I would like to make some changes within the unit and I, to make it more accessible. Mm -hmm. So what, what Fair Housing says is that the condo association has to allow a person to do that, but they can also ask the person to pay for it. Yes, exactly. Unlike th another law, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and one of the reasons is that the condo is where you live. You've, you've typically purchased it, or if you, even if you are a renter, you're, you have a, an owner. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, fair housing law, they did not want to say that all older condominiums had to put in expenses because you didn't know which unit a person with a disability might want to live in. Exactly. Yeah. And just because they're disabled, the assumption is, oh, it's all going to be on the ground floor. No, no. not at all. Right. They can be on any floor that they want right. to be. Right. Um, in my past experience in property management, at least, uh, the most common requests I used to get for reasonable modification was for a ramp. You know, they can't get their wheelchair up yeah. the the, up onto the sidewalk, and grab bars in the shower. Showers, yep. right. And a lot of people know that under the fair housing law for those kind of requests, it says that you must put the unit back in the same shape it was before you rented it. Right. But what a lot of people don't realize, is, and it's not written into the law, but if the modifications that have been made do not affect somebody who is not disabled from renting the property, you would normally not make them unwiden a door that you had widened right. to accommodate a wheelchair, or even take the grab bars. Right, or, and, and if you're putting it into a common area, like the front door, you mm -hmm. would not necessarily want to take away a ramp to the front door, because there might be somebody next week or next month that's renting. Yeah, oh, well, and I always joke, you know, let them leave the grab bars in the shower, because we're all going to need them one day. So. Yeah. <laughs> so you and I were chatting before the show um, because I brought up a fact that I had a condo association where a owner had requested to put in a ramp. Mm -hmm. And the board president did not allow the ramp. He decided to have a curb cut put in. And the, okay, and the reason he did that is because he knew that this request was going to come again someday. And why not do it right the first time? And uh, I think that was a wise decision on that association's right. part. Right. Well, they actually would have to allow the person oh, yeah. to put it in. They could condition putting it in on meeting certain standards. Mm -hmm. But if it's in the common area, the maintenance and liability is going to fall on the association. Exactly. So it's really wise for the association to take the bull by the horns and to go ahead and do it. Because if, if I were to ask to put in... A, a ramp because I had an elderly person or a person with a disability in, in where I lived. The fact is that it's going to be used by everybody with their shopping yep. carts, baby strollers, yep, it is. and everything. So the association really ought to do it, yep. you know, and not say, hey, you know, you can go ahead and put it yep. in the way you want because you want to make sure it's got the right slopes and the right yep. grab handrails and everything. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and okay. when we come back, we're going to talk about reasonable accommodations, which is different than modifications, right. but we'll be right back with more of the Condo Insider. 
This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. We have this crazy thing going on today. I was just walking by and all these DJs and producers are set up all around the city. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? And they told me they were making music. So we do it. And welcome back to the Condo Insider. Everything you ever wanted to know about living and owning in a condominium. And we have our guest with us again today, Francine Y, the Executive Director of the Disability and Communication Access Board of the Department of Health. And before we went to break, we were talking about reasonable um, modifications, right? Um, but there's also this area called reasonable accommodations. Right. Yeah, that's a little bit different. You want to explain that to us? Yes. Uh, as I said, reasonable modification is modifying bricks and mortar, yeah. handrails, grab bars, ramps, when, uh, uh, something even as far as a lift into a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. Reasonable accommodation is uh, a modification to your policies and procedures the way you do business. So the uh, the easiest example I could give, which I say easy, but that but it's not typical, is let's say somebody has a set of bylaws, yeah, and it's printed on a piece of paper. But you have a tenant or a condo a condo owner who is blind or visually impaired, low vision, and they can't read it and they say, I'd like to get a copy in Braille or large print, or I'd like it in electronic format so I can listen to it on the computer you know, with voice mm -hmm. synthesizer. That is an accommodation, because you're modifying the way you do business in order to accommodate a person with a disability. Well, so, I'll have to admit, I learned something from you all the time. I had never thought of the aspect of the Condo Association's documents. I know when I teach classes, if somebody is disabled, they need to let me know so I can provide the proper you right. know, signer, braille documents. I had never thought of that for bylaws and house rules and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I learned something new every day. <laughs> so another uh, type of accommodation might be that if I am in a, un if I'm in a building with central maintenance fees that includes electricity, but that also means that nobody has air conditioning, mm -hmm. so as, as an example. Yeah. But I have a respiratory condition or, that requires me to be on oxygen or, or requires me to have an air conditioner because I have to clear the air. I have a doctor's note. Mm -hmm. So I may have to run the electricity 24-7 for that particular uh, device. So the association might have to accommodate their policy of no AC or whatever to accommodate my needs to have additional equipment. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because one of my friends who was here on Oahu um, from Maui for a few months um, going through rehab from a hip replacement um, needed to be in an air-conditioned environment and where she was staying um, was one of those situations where electricity was included in the maintenance fee. So she was allowed to have an air conditioner, but she paid an additional That's $50 correct. a month correct. for it. That's correct. Yeah. And, and uh, so the electric company can give you an, a really good, very accurate um, estimate of how much you're um, running a... Mm -hmm. A uh, BiPAP machine or a CPAP machine or oxygen concentrator would be. And in fact, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, when they give subsidies for 
low to moderate income houses, for instance, at public housing, they have an adjustment based upon different types of appliances if you happen to have a disability. So that's already built in and calculated. They'll give you $27 a month more or yeah. $40 or whatever it might be, depending upon your situation. So that's not an uncommon request. Um, somebody might say, you know, you might have a rule that says only tenants may uh, use the washing machine because you don't obviously you don't want to be having all your relatives come in exactly. and use the machine. But if I if you have an individual who has an attendant and that individual has quadriplegia and can't do his own laundry, then the the rule has to be modified to allow the tenant to use the washing machine. Funny you should say that. I've been noticing over the last few years more and more um, rules, so to speak, where they're now acknowledging caretakers right. also being covered if they're taking care, care of somebody of who is right. disabled. Right. Yes. So at least now we're getting to the point where caretakers are also acknowledged because somebody's got to come in and do, do the this work. stuff for, yeah. for people Get with their disabilities. Mail, yeah. Do the laundry have an extra set of keys perhaps because the individual's going to be coming in two or three times a day and the, typically the condo association rules only give a key out to somebody who's residing yeah. there. Now the other thing is in regards to rules is, and I've seen it many times, um, is no external uh, uh, ornamentation outside the door like please take your slippers off, that kind of stuff. Right. But if the person is hearing impaired, as an example, they must allow them to install one of the special um, doorbells. Right. Which, when they push the doorbell, the lights flash yes. in the unit. And yes. So if someone's deaf or hard of hearing, the, um, the adjustments could include that type of doorbell. Uh, if they have something on their phone, probably nobody would ever, yeah. you don't, wouldn't need any kind of uh, special permission to do that, but yeah. So there's there's a lot of nuanced things that, that people may need to be accommodated, and that's um, what reasonable accommodation means. Well, I think also when you talked about policy, like the bylaws and stuff like that, you could actually have something in the bylaws or the house rules that on the face of it doesn't look discriminatory. Right. Um, but the enforcement of it becomes discriminatory, which is disparate impact, which has really come up again uh, in the last couple years because people have good intentions when they make policy, but don't think beyond that policy that it could have an effect right. on somebody with a disability. Right. right. Uh, so we're seeing more and more of those cases starting to pop up. Right. Now, uh, by far, and, and I, don't, I know we're not going to discuss this today because this is a whole radio show by itself. But by far the biggest reasonable accommodation request is for somebody to have uh, an animal, yep. or, uh, which would be either in, in housing, either a service animal or an emotional support animal in uh, an association or a building that doesn't allow pets. If it allows pets, that's not the issue. I think at every seminar you and I have ever done, that is the number one topic. That's right. But prior to that, happening, because that's sort of been really on the rise in the last four or five years. I think one of the biggest issues at a condo association prior to the emotional support animal issue or service animal issue was parking. parking right. <laughs> right. Because, well, because parking's limited. Mm -hmm. And in many condo associations, and even some apartments as well, there is a specifically a specific assigned stall, yeah. and it comes deeded to the condo. So it's very difficult to, uh, if not impossible, to force somebody to give up a mm -hmm. parking stall. So if you have a hundred unit building and you have a hundred unit, I mean, excuse me, you have a hundred units and you have a hundred parking stalls, and you don't have any extras, there's not a lot of flexibility yeah. there when those, they're deeded. And so if I buy into a unit, and at the time that I buy into it, I don't have a disability, but I decide to live there for 40 years or 30 years, and at some point acquire a disability, I might be using a wheelchair, and then what happens? 
I say I want a, I want an accessible parking stall, and my parking stall's on the fifth floor. Mm -hmm. But I can't force the person who has their parking assigned next to the first floor and the ground floor to give up their parking. You know, if all parking is not assigned um, but is open and the management has the opportunity to reserve a stall, that's different. Yeah. And then you get into real complications when, when either you have a unit that's part rental, part owners, part vacation rentals, which are, which are going to be transient, mm -hmm. or that you have people p with placards parking in the guest stalls. That's another yeah. difficult and, issue. And, you know, one of the things that over all the years that I've been doing management and stuff, there people always complain about the special things that the disabled person gets. Well, I try to remind people in my classes and even one-to-one -one that being a person with a disability is the only minority group that you can become a member of in an instant. Yeah. You can have a stroke, you can get hit by a car, and suddenly you are now part of this minority group. And I've actually seen it where I've had people argue with me about giving a special parking space. And then a couple years later, they themselves are disabled and demanding the same. The same, you know. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's an interesting aspect there. Yeah, I, I'd say parking is very difficult to uh, mm -hmm. accommodate. And sometimes, depending upon uh, the organization, the way the association is structured, you can encourage people to swap stalls. Yes. But uh, sometimes it just isn't possible. When the law was written, there was an expectation, not expect, there was the assumption. There was the assumption that management had control of all the parking stalls, which isn't the case. And management could then say, Scott, if you need a parking stall because you have a placard, we're going to give you stall 101. Mm -hmm. And we're going to move, and they could move people around. And in some places they can. In some places they can. They can do yeah. that. But I found that the vast majority they can't. They do can't. That. Yeah. It, it, the parking, uh, to me, seems in a commercial setting it's possible. In a residential setting like a condominium, it it can get pretty hairy. That's right. Well, we've run out of time. time. It's the fastest thirty minutes we've ever gone through. But uh, again, I want to thank our guest Francine for coming in today. I'm always fascinated with everything that she tells me, and I, again, learned something new today just sitting next to you. So thank you again for being on the Condo Insider. You're welcome. And be sure to tune in next Thursday for everything you ever wanted to know about condominium living and condominium ownership right here on Condo Insider. Thank you.